Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you are here in the building with us. Some of you for the first time. So exciting to have you here today. I'm going to say this like I do a lot of times on these recordings. If you are not in the building with us, you miss a lot. This has been a good morning. It's always a good morning, but there's so much that happens when you're physically in the building with God's people that you can't experience through a screen. I'm not giving any of you a hard time. If you watch me online, you know that I routinely advocate for the fact that if it does what a church does, it's a church, even if it's electronic. But if you can and are able to be in a building, it is so good to be with God's people. And I'd love to have you here on a Sunday morning. I have a message for you today. If you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 26 through 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. I have a lot of other scripture, but everything we'll talk about today will hinge off of this passage. If you're someone that likes to take notes and you like to give those notes titles, this, message, this message's title is Boasting in the Lord. Boasting in the Lord. That's great. You know you're doing good when somebody in the back of the room holds up their phone and shows you they already have the passage highlighted in their Bible because the Lord's already talked to them about it. <laughs> That's a good day. I'm going to read this passage to you. We're going to pray, and we're going to hear what the Lord has to say to us this morning. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 26. Brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective. Not many are powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world and what is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something so that no one can boast in his presence. But it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became God-given wisdom for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that as it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you that you've been present during worship and during the other aspects of celebration that we've experienced this morning. I pray now that your anointing will be with us and your spirit will be present so that we can receive your word in the spirit it was intended. I pray that I will speak clearly and precisely so that I represent you well. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will rest upon those who are listening and they will hear what you intended for them to hear. And more importantly, Lord, I pray that we will leave this place not just having heard a clever speech, but we will leave this place anointed and changed so that we can go and do the work of the kingdom in our lives when we leave this room. By the power of your spirit, be faithful to enrich us in our relationship, not for our own sake, but for the sake of your name and your kingdom. We ask these things in your holy name, Lord. Amen. Boasting in the Lord. In order to be truly filled with Christ and equipped to fulfill his calling, we must go through a process of being emptied of everything in us that is not him. If we want to be able to do the great thing that that book promises that we can do, that that man who prayed for you, that that pastor who encouraged you, that that mother who told you the Lord has great things for you, son, great things for you, daughter, to reach the point that we're able to do that, we have to reach the point that we are filled with nothing but Christ. Because if I'm trying to do things in my own strength, they will fail, and I will find myself empty in the eternal sense, but too full of myself for the Lord to be able to do the work that even he intends to get done. I must be emptied of me. I think everyone in this room knows something about what my family has been through in the last month. We've all been through something difficult at some point in our life where the Lord had to reveal some things to us. And in the process of the Lord beginning to heal and restore me, he also used the opportunity of my brokenness to say, Son, while we're in here working, there are some things cluttering up your heart and your spirit 
that I need to get out of the way in order for the ministry that I've called you to do to move forward, in order for your church and your congregation, in order for those that you minister to online, in order for the kingdom to be moved forward in accordance with my will, not just for your life, but for the area and region in which you live, there are some things we need to call out of your heart, my son. And I have very personally and intimately been through And I do not want to say through as I am done. I am not done until the day I die. But I have been through a process recently of being emptied of some things because I had to realize that I can't properly do the work of the Lord if any part of me is inclined to take credit for what only he can do. Nobody likes a braggart that wants to talk about, I did this in the name of the Lord. Look at the great thing that I've done. There's this false sense of humility that that Christians in particular struggle with because we still have this human component of us that wants to take credit for what happened. Well, yeah, the Lord provided everything, but I swung the hammer. I came up with the plans. I had to drive there. I've done my part, and the Lord filled in the gaps. No, that's not how it worked at all. We can boast in nothing but the Lord. Paul describes this idea of taking credit for what we've done. That's what he means when he says boasting. And too often we find ourselves in a place we don't think about ourselves as boasting or bragging. We feel justified in qualifying ourselves. I don't mean to brag, but I do have an ordination certificate on the wall in my office. So what I say is important. (laughs) Right? We don't want it to sound that way, but to the people that are not initiated, that are not already in the will of God, that are not in a place where they're willing to hear from him, me trying to force my qualifications on them when the qualifications of God himself aren't enough is not going to get me any further. It's going to drive the wedge deeper and cause more problems. We're talking about actively applying faith. We can't brag about things and expect that to give us some leverage to get the work of God done because God himself is enough. What I need to do is get myself out of the way so God has some room to do the work. You've probably heard some of these phrases. We don't don't think about ourselves as bragging. And I won't put this on you. Certainly none of you have done this. You're a good church. You're good people. But you've probably met some of those other Christians from other churches. Maybe some of them were even Baptist. For those of you online, a very good Baptist minister friend of mine is here, and that's a joke Between me and I, if you're Baptist, it's all good, brother. It's okay. Some of those other denominations that are not represented here, (laughs) maybe they're the ones that you've heard say this. My great struggle is evidence that I'm doing something in the kingdom worth opposing. (sighs) Yeah, brother, I'm really blessed, and the blessings that I have that God has given me, it's because he's rewarded me for my faithfulness through difficult times. You know what? God has allowed some terrible things to happen to me, but he's done it so that he can use me to demonstrate his greatness. Look at this great thing. I was able to accomplish all of this only because of the Lord. We don't think about that as bragging and boasting. I've presented them to you in the way that they sound to people that are not in Christ. But we say them amongst ourselves and want to celebrate that. Yeah, look at the great thing the Lord's helped me build. Look at it. Look at the great thing the Lord has built because God is great. I've got to get me out of the equation. All of those statements are misguided ones that place me at the center rather than Christ at the center of my salvation and the work of the kingdom upon the earth. We don't boast in anything but Christ. Until you relinquish your claim to even the work of God that has happened in your life, you will find yourself continually being emptied, oftentimes painfully so, until the point that you can bow your knee and you can sincerely and honestly say, it was all God. Because he will scoop that false humility right out of you. And he will scoop that focus on your pain and your suffering right out. Because there's not a place for it. When God says, I 
get the glory. I get the work done. You don't get to brag. Until we can sincerely, can sincerely look at our life and say, it's all him, the truth of the matter is we're not fit to do the work. If you look at verse 26 of this passage we started with this morning, Paul begins and he says, brothers, consider your calling. Ladies, it's okay. Culturally, he's talking to the fellas because they're the ones he would have talked to. Y'all are in this. You're not excluded. You also don't have a way out. You with me? We're all in this together. Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, consider your calling. Just the greeting alone that Paul uses here is very telling because he says, you people who are just like me. Wait a minute, aren't we talking about Paul? Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, been tortured, beaten, had, was treated really poorly by the disciples and had to basically beg and earn and borrow and steal and get some friend to help him get in the door so that he could even preach the gospel without being persecuted by the other Christians? Aren't we talking about Paul? And he says, brothers, people, folks, y'all that are like I am, He says, you who are just like me, discern and perceive. Oh, you want this to be deep, don't you? Discern and perceive how common even your divine calling is. Huh? Let me put it to you this way. We all get excited about the call of God being upon our lives, but Paul starts this passage by saying, as great as that call is and as proud as you are of it, everybody else got that same call too. Everybody, all of them. It's like that piece of junk mail that's like, that you got that says, you've been chosen. Open immediately. Matter of fact, I got an email right before church this morning. That says, open immediately, congratulations, we've chosen you. No, you didn't. You stole my email and my phone number and my address, just like you did those other thousands of people you sent this to, hoping somebody else would think they were special. We are victims of ourselves when we think I need to be made special and important because of what God has done for me or in me or through me or what that man at the tent meeting prayed over me or because my mama said that I was the best 10-year-old in her whole house. I was the only 10-year-old in her whole house at the time. But that doesn't matter. I need to be important and special and validated and qualified. And what I've been through, if people won't recognize it on their own, I'll tell my story and I'll make sure they know I deserve to be here. And then I can do the great work of the Lord. No, Paul says, y'all that are just like me, everybody got the same invitation to do what you've been asked to do. We simply need to do it. And stop reveling in the fact that we were invited to. That goes against everything we want to believe about our salvation. Because we want special and unique and chosen. Not just to mean that I'm special. But what we want is a ranking system. We want to say that brother EJ is better than me because he's preached longer. And I'm lesser than. But I'm definitely better than Hank. Because Hank doesn't have a certificate to preach at all. We want that in our human nature. We want to say, this anointing is better than that one. My church is bigger than yours. I have more money than you. I've prayed for more people. I wrote more of the Bible than you did. Nah. And the, even Paul, who was among the greatest, Paul, who obviously, this is in Scripture, the Lord wouldn't have let it be there if it didn't belong, says, we're all alike and we all got the call. There is no ranking system. Paul reminds us of that case. He reminds us that we're no better than one another and that we all serve the same God. You need some evidence for that? I would love to give you some. I'm glad you asked. There are a hundred verses in Scripture that says God stays the same. He's the same for you, and he's the same for me, and he's the same ten years ago and two centuries ago, and he'll still be the same decades from now. He stays the same. A hundred times Scripture tells us that. Let me give you one just so you know I'm not making it up. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Wait a minute, Pastor, I thought you said God. That says Jesus Christ. Okay, first of all, y'all are probably on TikTok if you thought that. Let me help you with this. Jesus is God. John 1, 1, in the beginning the Word was with God. 
Well, but that's the word. You really want to argue with me about this? Go to verse 14, same chapter. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. That's Jesus. Jesus is God. God is the same. Are, are, are we on the same page? Do, we need to, do I need to reteach seven months worth of the life of John so that we can be on the same page that Jesus is God? No? Good. Thanks. <laughs> And just so you know, that's not just a New Testament idea and that God has been the same. Genesis 126, God is speaking and he says, let us make man in our image. I don't think God was Looney Tunes and talking to himself. I'm pretty sure that all three aspects of God were present and he wasn't just talking in the mirror, which, Lord help me. Y'all said you came to have church, right? You wanted, you wanted me to preach. We want to argue sometimes and split hairs and, and get all nitpicky about, well, I know that's in the Bible, but that's in the Old Testament. Jesus never said that. <laughs> Some of you already know where I'm going with this. The Lord doesn't tend to disagree with himself. And just because Jesus didn't say it doesn't mean that it's not true anymore. In fact, the silence of Jesus more than likely just means, I don't think I need to say that again. Weren't you listening when my father said it? Because they were all together in the beginning and they were in agreement and have been the whole time. So the lack of evidence for something coming out of the mouth of Jesus is never an excuse not to do what the Lord said or believe what scripture tells us. That's not even in the notes. That's for free. I got to keep going. We're already running late. and Y'all only gave me 39 minutes that I could speak or something like that. <laughs> Take my time. Who? Bless the Lord. I felt the Lord on that. Amen. Take my time. Let me get back on track. God is still the same. We get the same God. You don't get some special version of him. There's no special dispensation of him for you. There's not some different version of him that comes to your house than comes to mine. God is God. You're not getting some better or more enlightened or more advanced version of him than anybody else in this church or in the kingdom of God anywhere else on the earth. They may see more fullness of him because they've left more space for him. But he himself is not different. You just didn't leave enough to get what they got. Not only is God the same for everybody, but God's gifts are equal for all of his children. Oh, no, now I've hurt your feelings probably. My gift's not better than anybody else's? No. It's not. There aren't any better blessings or better anointings or higher callings. There's the one that God's called you to that your invitation may have read differently, but it's the same invite that your neighbor got or that your pastor got or that the prophet got or that the homeless guy who found Jesus in a ditch got. James 1.17, every generous act and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of light. With him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. Whatever gift or talent or personality or opportunity you've got is the same as everyone else from an eternal perspective. Your gift and your anointing does not make you special. Every gift, if it is good, came from him. This passage, we like to read it and say, okay, God doesn't change. In him there's no shadow of turning. But that's taking it out of context. This verse says every good thing came from him. It came down from the Father of lights. And with him there's no shadow. He came as an unchanging God to give you a gift that doesn't have any shadow or shade or difference or change or level of gradation of how great it is in it. Because it all came from him and it's all his. And he's always good. There's no variation in the gift that he's given you. We like to talk. Oh, God, help me. We like to talk about sins. And we love that, oh, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. This is, this is good here. We like that statement because when I've done something that's really horrific, I get to feel better about it because my sin's no different than yours, brother. Yeah, I cheated on my wife, but you cheated on your taxes, and there ain't no difference, so you can't make me feel bad about what I did. You stole the pen off the desk at the doctor's office, and you speed, and Romans says we should obey the law of the land, so my sin's no worse than yours. You leave me alone. We like it when it's equal because it's sin. We don't like it when it's equal because my gift doesn't make me special. Your function in the kingdom is not to be special, it's to be obedient and apply what he gave you. Your function is not to be special. 
We're not called to find out who the special, most anointed, most closest to Lord, the Lord person is and go follow them and see what the Lord says to them and try to copy them and mimic them and climb the ladder till we get to the point that we're as great as they are because no such thing exists. Every good gift comes from God. You're called not to identify the elite and aspire to be like them. You're called to humble yourself before the sight of a holy God and do the work that he's asked you to do knowing that it is equal in the scope of eternity to any other gift or any other calling or any other function that he's called someone else to. We boast only in the Lord. Paul himself places himself on the same level as a common weekly church attender. We already talked about how great he is, and he says, Brothers, we're all alike. We're all going to my house to eat spaghetti afterwards. We're all going to drink water out of the same tap. We're all going to experience the same throne room of heaven and the same presence of the same God. My name's Paul, and that didn't mean nothing. Because I can only boast in the Lord. Every gift comes from God. The gifts are without status. If it's good, it's His. You got it from Him, and you don't have anything to do with it. You didn't earn it by being good enough or special enough or being born at the right time or in the right place or because somebody prayed over you or because they spilled the bottle of anointing oil. There's nothing special. You didn't earn it. And therefore, even those gifts that you have and the work God's done in your life, it's nothing that you can brag about. Job 121, my brother read it a couple of weeks ago. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And Job says, praise the name of the Lord. Why? Because what the Lord gave me doesn't matter and what I've lost doesn't matter because the name of the Lord is what matters. I can't boast in anything but that name. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 the passage with the gifts of the Spirit. You know that one. But the, the verse 11, it says, One and the same Spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as He wills. Some translations say, as He sees fit. God decides if you get it, how long you get to keep it, what you get to do with it while you've got it. It's not even yours. Apart from your salvation, nothing even belongs to you that God gave you. We can't boast in anything but God, not even in His gifts. We boast in God Himself. It doesn't matter how big your ministry is or what you've done. When we're emptied of ourselves, then we're able to boast in Him. Get this. If we're emptied of ourselves, we can boast in Him no matter who He's working through. It doesn't matter if it's the Baptist preacher or the Methodist preacher. I'll tell you this. We talked earlier this morning about the investment that EJ has made in my life. I didn't seek him out. I didn't ask the Lord for him. I wasn't even looking to be ministered to. Matter of fact, standing right about here the first week that EJ was here, I looked him in the eye and I said, I am so hurt and so frustrated with what's going on in my life right now. I don't even want any friends. Please don't try to be friends with me. I wasn't being unkind, not deliberately. I was just broken and hurt. But when the Lord reaches down and begins to empty out what doesn't belong in you and you begin to give him the place that he's supposed to have, you're able to celebrate the work of the Lord being done in whoever does it. I don't know why God's blessing that pastor or that church across town. It doesn't matter. Let's look at your heart. What's wrong with the fact that you can't celebrate the people that they're ministering to? God did not call this church to minister to all the big rich people that can afford to put on that big event at that church, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. The homeless, tattooed, drug-addicted people that have come on the property here, God didn't call them to go over there to get what they needed. He sent them here. There's no difference. Are we doing what God's called us to do? Are we functioning the way he's asked us to? If we're truly emptied of ourselves, I can boast in Christ no matter who does the work or what work gets done as long as I know it's the Lord. We can't boast in anything but him. In fact, I, I want to look at another passage this morning, Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Therefore, let him, or let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with our sacrifices. There's that phrase in there that we use frequently. I remember it from the 80s because I'm old. But there was this praise chorus we used to sing about bringing a sacrifice of praise. You probably know it. A handful of you probably have heard that one. Yeah, the little sing-songy Hosanna tape. It was probably yellow, and you got it in the mail from the subscription that you had. I'm really telling how old I am now. Does anybody even know what a cassette is in here? Uh, a couple of you. 
talk about bringing the sacrifice of praise, and we talk about that being great because we think about I'm going to stand up at the front and we're going to bring our sacrifice of praise, and that's, that's fun, that's exciting, but you know a sacrifice is something that died that didn't deserve to? A sacrifice was a cost. There was an investment in it, and there was something lost on the part of the person that brought it. We're talking about boasting in the Lord. That means I give up my right to brag about what God has done through me, even if I could rightly say, look at the great work I did. Even if I could rightly say, I've been through a whole lot. My situation is even worse than yours. My sacrifice of praise is that I say, I have no right even to those things. God has been good. God has done some great work. Sometimes the sacrifice is that I set aside even what I deserve or feel entitled to in the eyes of men so that I can be pleasing in the sight of God because this passage says God is pleased with such sacrifices. That phrase doesn't just mean go, pray, go to church and praise him even if you're tired. Oh my gosh, we have no idea what sacrifice is. Go to church and praise him even though you're having a hard time. Even though you don't know where the extra $10 for the light bill is going to come from, go praise the Lord anyhow. There's truth in that, but we've minimized it and turned it into some kind of a tiny little catchphrase. And we don't really have a sense of the weight of sacrifice. It doesn't mean just praise him because you're beaten, beaten down and treated poorly and you're under attack. It doesn't mean praise him even though things don't look real good right now and it's raining outside and you wanted to be in the boat this afternoon. That's not sacrifice. This means praise him even when you could take credit. It means praise him even when you have a right and you're entitled. To praise God, it's a sacrifice that's going to cost you something. And that's going to take an attitude adjustment. That means you've got to set aside that false humility and that, oh, yeah, it's just the Lord, brother. I mean, I know I did the work, but we give God all the credit for around, stuff around here. Yep. We've got to change our attitude and say, even when I think I have the right, I'm sacrificing and I'm boasting in the Lord instead of in myself. Psalm 145.3, great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. Mark 10.18, none is good but God. Don't boast in your own goodness. And I've alluded to this already. We, we, we're pretty okay with not boasting in our own goodness most of the time. Here's the hard one. Don't boast in your suffering either. What do you mean, Pastor? Nobody brags. <laughs> Nobody brags about their suffering. How about this? Let me say it this way. Don't one-up each other. When it comes to struggling and suffering and difficulty, don't boast in reverse by saying, I had it worse than you. This is my big testimony soapbox that I get on every once in a while. So y'all just go with me. I'm going to step up on it. It is maddening to me that people say, in the name of the Lord, I'm going to give my testimony. And for 45 minutes, I'm going to tell you how much fun I had with those women I slept with and the drugs that I did and all of the illegal things that I got away with and the way I never got caught. And oh, how great it was to go to all those places and do all those things. And you get down to the last three and a half minutes in their testimony and they say, oh, but the Lord saved me from all that. What do you mean the Lord saved you from all that? You sold me on the sin. I want to go there. We don't boast in our suffering. Well, I had such and such a sickness. Well, you had, I, I know you had COVID, but I was in the hospital sick for a week. You got to just stay home and take medicine. Oh, well, you know what? My wife nearly died. Well, you know what? I know somebody that did die and they pronounced him dead and they had to pray for him and bring him back to life. Why are we bragging about the worst thing that happened? Why are we giving the enemy so much glory and boasting in the suffering and the wickedness? God healed me. Well, God healed me more. Are we in the third grade? Why are we bragging about who was the most sick and the most lost and the most hurt? What does the horror of your wretched life benefit the kingdom? I'm not trying to be mean, but Paul says don't boast. And we'll do it backwards sometimes. And say, I'm not bragging. I was the lowest of the low. Wait a minute. <laughs> that sounds a whole lot like I'm the highest of the high, but because I was worst off, the Lord brought me through more. So It's all level. The net benefit of bragging about what you were saved from is absolutely zero, eternally speaking. 
the value of bragging about your sin and your brokenness and your hurt and your struggle is net zero to the kingdom. I'm not saying that, that we, we are, it's not that we aren't compassionate to people. It's not that we don't love people, but it's that when I say I'm going to tell my story for the Lord, I'm going to go do the work of the Lord. I don't brag and qualify myself by how bad it was and what God saved me from any more than I brag about how great he was and what he did through me. You don't boast either direction. If you're boasting in what he saved you from, then your sin is still at the center of your life. If I'm bragging about how bad it was, I'm still focused on that. And there's some things I need to get removed so there's some room for God in here. Your testimony is not what what God saved you from. It's what God saved you for. I'm going to say that again so I don't stumble over it. Your testimony is not what God saved you from. It's what he saved you for. It's what God has done since he saved you, not how awful you were before you met. We've got to boast in the Lord. God saved all of us from everything. You're not ever going to one-up that, so just give it up. No matter what he forgave you, that forgiveness just gets us back to square one. That's just a starting point so that now we can go do the work. You would never brag about the fact that, yeah, I'm going back to kindergarten to start over. Yeah, I'm so dumb. I had to go back. Had to take high school all over again. That's nothing to brag about. Now let's put it in context. I was such a terrible person that God had to do all this work just to get me to the place where he could start using me for anything. That's not something to be proud of. It's square one. It's the starting point. The real work and the real boasting happens when he starts doing what you can't do. His work and his power and his correction and his judgment and his vengeance and his peace and his grace and his mercy, they all flow from his name. His name is what's great. That's what we boast in. Don't identify this morning with your suffering anymore. His name is great and that's what you're identified with. Who you are is not determined by what you did to yourself or what mess you found yourself in or what horrible thing the world visited on you from outside that you had no control over. That's not who you are. The enemy would love to trick you into giving hell credit for who you are by having you say, my struggle made me this. No, it did not. What the Lord did from you at the end of that struggle, what the Lord did for you through that struggle to get you to here made you who you are. God declared who you are. God created you, knew you in your mother's womb planned your days and your steps before you ever arrived on this earth your identity is in him not in what you survived galatians 3 26 you're all sons of god through your faith in jesus christ don't give credit to your suffering for who you are today don't boast in those horrible things and think this made me who i am and i wouldn't trade it your god decided who you are And your God is trying to scoop that garbage out of you to get you back to the place that he can fill you up and you can actually be what you were made to be and call yourself a son or a daughter of God. Don't boast in the work of the enemy. We boast in Christ alone. Genesis 1.27, it says God created man in his own image. Neither your sin nor your situation have any bearing on who you are in Christ. None. We got to. As Christians, sacrifice our story for the sake of his. Boast in his name and in his work. And we've got to understand the necessity of having nothing to brag about but Christ. I have two more very short stories and references, and I will close today. First one is this. You've heard the story of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. He comes before Jesus, and he tells him all the great things that he's done. Here's how great I am, Lord. I've kept all the laws. I've done all the things. Now what must I do? And Jesus pops that balloon real quick in verse, 11, or verse 21. He says, you lack one thing. You're missing something. It's just one thing. Just, just, just one little thing. Sell all that you have and follow me. Take everything about you and make it secondary to everything about me. We think about the rich young ruler being a story about the riches that a man wasn't willing to give up. 
But the story is actually about the fact that someone refused to find himself in Christ rather than finding himself in his stuff and his own work. It's not about the money. Because he wasn't willing to find himself in Christ, nothing he had was of value anyway. Without Christ, we got nothing to brag about. And when we boast in anything other than Christ, we end up empty and bitter. Verse 22 of that same story says that the man walked away grieving. You do a little study on that word, it means vexed, troubled, bitter, heavily discontent, deeply dissatisfied was how he walked away. Even though he kept everything that was important to him, he walked away feeling emptier than he'd ever been. Our focus has got to be on God himself. Or we'll find ourselves like this man. But the flip side of that is another story that we find in the Old Testament. That idea of satisfaction that's been produced by God's presence in our life. If you look at Ruth, how many know the story of Ruth? Who? Job gets a lot of attention for having a hard life, but Ruth's backstory is brutal. It's tough. Ruth 121, she's in the midst of frustration and anguish and hurt over her position in life, and she says, I went out full, but the Lord brought me home empty. I went out having everything I thought I needed, and the Lord brought me back with nothing. And that sounds tragic, but when you read everything from there forward, it's about how God took her emptiness and filled it with everything that she ever needed and that he ever intended. He had to empty that out so that she had nothing to boast in but the Lord himself and what he had done for her. We'll, we'll either empty ourselves and find ourselves unfulfilled or we'll be emptied of ourselves and find ourselves in Christ. you got two options. Both of them leave you empty. But only one of them fills you back up. Our Christian life is one of becoming empty of anything but Christ. Empty of myself, empty of my sin, and empty of my accomplishments. And the Lord is working in every circumstance to empty the space within you that he has designed for him to occupy. If you'll stand with me, I'm about to close. We can't allow ourselves to fill that space that the Lord is emptying within us with anything other than him. Anything other than his name. The question I've got for you this morning is this. What is your boast today? You certainly have one. What is it? Is it in what you've done? Is it in what you've done with your own hands? Is it even in what you've done for the Lord? Is it in what God saved you from? We all have a story of what God's pulled us out of, but is that what you're proud of? Is the mess? Or is what you boast in this morning the Lord himself? His name and his work in your life since the day that he restored you. Paul writes in verse 31 of the passage we began with this morning, the one who boasts must do so in the Lord. God chooses the foolish and the weak and the despised and the insignificant. He chooses those who have nothing to brag about, those who set aside the claim to their own success, the ones who spiritually realize who they are in the presence of a holy and mighty God. God chooses those people and fills them with wisdom and them with strength and them he gives value. It's these people that he gives the power and the authority of his very family name, child of God. It's those people who have received his name and know that it is the only thing of value in their life. It is those who accomplish the purpose of God and get the kingdom's work done upon the earth. I pray this morning that you will find your boast in the Lord and not in something else. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather in your house. I thank you for this word. I thank you for this revelation. I pray, Lord, that your work is done in the hearts of your people, that we hold on to what you had for us this morning. I pray, Lord, that our boast would be in you and nothing less, not in what I can do, not even in what you've done, but in who I am because you have made me your son. You have made me your daughter. You have stamped me with your family name and nothing else is of value. This morning, we lift your name high. We've done it in worship. We've done it in praise. We've done it in prayer. We've done it in this message. And Father, I pray that you'll empower us to leave this place doing it with our lives for the sake of the kingdom. 
I pray that anything I've spoken that wasn't in alignment with your heart and your spirit gets burned away and forgotten in the minds of hearts and hearts of those you've gathered, God. But what came from your spirit, I pray that you bury it deep within them and call it to their remembrance at the most appropriate time and that it never leaves them just as you promised that you wouldn't. Be with us as we go. Keep us safe as we go. Bring us back here at your appointed time and be glorified in all that we say and do from now until the day we meet you face to face. In your name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. I will see you again soon.